Hello everybody and welcome back to another card game tutorial video. In this video we're going to be working on coding attacks for our game. And in the next video we're going to add summoning and defeat animations. So if you're interested and want to see more be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you want to support this series be sure to check out my Patreon linked in the description below. So to begin, we're going to start with bug fixes from the last video. If you remember in the last video, when we had cards leave the field and go to the graveyard, they didn't go in the order we wanted them to. So what that looks like is if I use scoop up, you'll see that scoop up is on a, you'll see that scoop up is being printed above all of those field cards. So that's all we're going to fix from the last video and that's going to be in our object field card in the draw event we're going to go down to where we have our depths being set and that's in these two conditions and we're going to create another condition that says if alarm zero is greater than negative one we're going to set the depth to be above all of the hand cards so the hand cards will have a maximum depth of negative 200. So we're just going to set this to be negative 300. And we know it's going to have a maximum depth of negative 200 because that's the way we had it in our card object. So you see when it's selected, its depth will be negative 200. When it's not selected, its depth is going to be negative 100 minus its hand position. So that's all we will need to do to fix that. So to test it, so that will look like this. We're gonna set Squirtle down with a few cards and we're gonna set a lot just so we know we can see it whenever we use it. So now if we use scoop up with all of these cards on the field, you'll see that scoop up is underneath all of the field cards. Now before we get into this, I no longer want to hear this audio. So I'm going to go to my object audio and to get it to stop making sound, I'm going to change this to be zero. Now for what we're doing in today's video, we need to create new variables and that will be in our field card object and what we need to do is initialize the variables we are going to use those variables will be an array of move select coordinates which you'll see here a move select variable and the damage that we will do now the values we have in the move select array are actually 218, 421, 424, and you can see them in this commented section. Now, I did it like this because when we get into creating new sizes of rooms, I want to make sure that this array will always have the correct variables. Now, if we go to our rooms, we can see that the width and the height are 640 by 807. So what I did is I took the number that I wanted, which was 218, divided it by the room width, and got this value. So I always want this X coordinate to be at this percentage of the room width. And I did that for all of these. Now when you go to create a game, you'll probably want to make sure that your room is sized better than 640 by 807. I just used this because that was the size of the image we used as the background. Again, the main purpose of this is if we were to ever resize the room, these coordinates will always be correct relative to the room size because we've created these equations. So I chose these variables using this Magikarp card. I used the Magikarp card because I took these images from Google, so a lot of these images aren't the best. As you can see, some of them have a little extra on the sides, or they're not centered properly. Like this Squirtle card. As you can see, the left is 
chopped off a little bit more and then the right has some white space. So this was the closest to perfect I had. I wanted the spot at this point and this point and this point and this point. So those are the four values we have in this array. So to better see them, we're going to draw those rectangles on top of these cards. And that will be in the object field card draw event. So if we go down to the condition, if selected is equal to true and remove energy is greater than zero, we're going to add these lines of code. So what these two conditions are doing is it's going to check to see if this Pokemon has two attacks. So it's going to refer to the strings array we initialized. And if the second attack does not have a null text in it, we know that this Pokemon has two attacks. And if it doesn't, and there is something other than a null text there, it knows that it only has one attack. So we're going to set the color to black in both instances. And then we're going to draw this rectangle. So this would be the space for the first move. This would be the space for the second move. And this would be the space from the top of the first move to the bottom of the second move in these instances. So as long as our mouse is within those coordinates, we're going to draw that rectangle. So now that we have that, let's test that out. So I'm going to use Squirtle. And since he is selected, if I move my cursor into his first attack, you'll see that that rectangle is being drawn. And then same if I move it to his second attack. But now let's choose a Pokemon that has one attack. And that is going to be Poliwag. So if I use Poliwag, there should only be one rectangle drawn. As you can see, since he only has one move, only that one move will be highlighted on. Now, we don't need this rectangle to be drawn, and it should be removed once you're done testing and you know that the code works properly. And then I set Magikarp down because his sprite is closest to perfect. Now that we have that, we know where our mouse needs to be to initialize an attack. So where we're going to do that is going to be in the step event. And before we add this condition, I want to condense these two mouse check button released events. So in order to do that, I'm going to remove this condition here. Fix the indentation. And add this whole condition into this one. So now I want to add a new condition to initiate an attack. So that's going to be an else if statement. And the condition is going to be if the position is equal to zero and it is selected, then we can attack. Now I chose position zero because typically that should be the only Pokemon that can attack. Now, this is going to change once we get into adding Pokemon powers, if you're familiar with the game. But for now, we're going to keep it simple and only test it at position zero. Now, we're going to copy over the condition to check if it has two moves, which is this one. And then that will also have an else statement. And we're also going to copy over the conditions that will dictate what move we select. And we're going to paste that in here as well. Except we're not going to draw the rectangle, so we're going to remove those. So if it's in the zero position and the card has been selected, and if the card has two attacks and our mouse 
is in the area of the first attack and the mouse has been released, what we're going to do is we're going to set the move select variable equal to one. We're going to set our damage equal to a script call called get damage. And we're going to pass it the card number and move select. And then we're going to divide it by 10. And then we're going to create a message called message send damage because we need to send it to the opponent whenever we begin networking. And we're going to send it two variables, damage and the position we are attacking, which we're going to set as zero for now. Again, we will change this later on, but for testing purposes, we're going to keep it basic. And then we're going to do the same thing for the second move, except we're going to change move select equal to two. But now let's create this script call. We're going to call it script get damage. And we're going to pass it two variables, the card number and the attack. If attack is equal to one, we're going to send it the number value of that corresponding attack. And if it's two, we're going to send it the number value for the second attack. And then we want to send this damage to the opponent. So we're going to call that script message send damage. And we're going to start it like we do all of our other messages. And we're passing it two variables, the damage value and the position. And then with the opponent, with the field card for that position, we're going to increment its damage counters by the damage value we passed. And before we test this, I want to clarify why we are using this condition, if mouse check button released, for the left mouse button, instead of just using the event for the mouse left button, is because if we were to put it in this event, that only triggers when the mouse left button would release on top of the collision mask for the sprite or for the object and we don't want that so now let's test this so if I select the squirtle first attack and I have to do that by holding down the left mouse button because that's the only way that this card object will remain selected now when I release the mouse button if I'm on that attack it will then send that damage so if I left release here we can see that it sent 10 damage to the opponent's Pokemon card. Now, there's two things we need to address here. If I set cards onto Squirtle, and if I try to select an attack, we can see that the cards cover his attack moves. And another issue we see is the array that initializes where the selection is does not move with the top card of the field object. So we've got to address those two things. And the first issue of having the pile cards being printed on top of the Pokemon when trying to select an attack, all we need to do is in this condition at line 91 in the draw event of the field card object we need to create an additional condition that says and mouse y is less than move select y position zero. So now this will only draw the pile sprite if the mouse is above the first attack box. And for the second issue, we need to move this initialization from the create event to the step event because these need to be static. So we're going to go to the top and underneath this condition, we're going to paste this here. 
and these are going to be functions of the pile count. So since when we add cards to the field card object, when we print it out, we move the topmost card by 20 pixels to the left and 20 pixels down. So that would be 20 pixels in the negative direction relative to X and 20 pixels in the positive direction relative to Y. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to put for our X coordinates minus pile count divided multiplied by 20 divided by 2. And for our Y direction, we're going to do the same, except we are going to add it. And we're going to do this for each one of these variables. So now if we retest it, so if I select Squirtle, we can see now that the selection box moves with the card and the pile cards are no longer printed on top of this card if we're underneath this line here. But as soon as I move above this line, you'll see that they are you'll see that they begin to print. And just so we know for sure that it's being printed in the same spot relative to this card, I'm going to use Magikarp again. So you see that the left and right sides of the box are practically flush with the yellow of the card. I'm going to add a few cards to Magikarp's pile. So you can see that they are in the same spot, just moved down depending on how many cards are in the pile. So now that we have that, we need to add code to defeat the Pokemon on the other end of the field. So as you can see, I could add as many damage counters to this and it doesn't do anything. So what we need to do is go to our opponent field card object. In the step event, we need to add the following conditions. We never want the damage counters to be less than zero. So if it ever goes under zero, we're going to set it to zero. And then if the health points is less than or equal to the damage counters, we want to set the opponent's field equal to zero, send a message to the player at the other end to allow them to draw a prize card and destroy the instance of this field card. So let's create this script message, which we're calling script message prize select and within that message we're going to add this same condition and all we're going to do is we're going to set the prize select variable in the player object equal to true and we're going to need to initialize this variable so if we go to the player create event scroll all the way down we're going to add it at the very end and we're going to set it equal to false. Now, whenever this condition is true, it's going to allow the player to select a prize card. So in our prize card object, we're going to add a new event, which will be a left released event. And what is going to be in this event is we're going to initialize four local variables, the card number, the X position, the Y position, and the prize position. Now we need to do this so we can pass it to the player object. And the first condition is going to be a script call that determines what prize card we have selected. 
So let's create that before I explain the rest. And that's going to be called prize card select. And what that is going to do is it's going to go down from the last prize card all the way down to the first. And it's going to check to see if the mouse X and Y position are within that card sprite. And if it is, it's going to return that position. If it's not, it's going to return negative one. If we go back to the prize card left released event, we say if the prize card we've selected is equal to this instance of the prize card, if the prize card select is true, we are going to then set it to false. And then with that player, we are going to add that card to our hand. So we are going to set the internal variable of our hand equal to card number. And then we're going to create a card object instance at the next hand position. And then with that card, we are going to say that it is in our hand. And these are all variables that already exist in the card object. We're going to set card in hand equal to true because that's going to send the card from its current position to its hand position. Now when we draw a card from the deck, it begins on a different path. And that path isn't the path we want this card to follow. We're going to set its hand position equal to the appropriate hand position. We're going to set its card number equal to the value that we set the newest card to be. And we're going to set its sprite index to the corresponding sprite in the sprite array. Then we're going to set our prize card position equal to no one because we will destroy it and we want to make sure we do this before we do that. And then we want to send a message to the opponent to remove that prize card from being printed on their end. And then we're going to update the opponent's view of our hand. So the only thing we need to create here is this message remove prize. And if the opponent object doesn't exist, we're going to return because it would crash the game if we tried to do this and an opponent object wasn't there. We are passing it one argument, which we're going to call prize number. And then on the and then in the opponent object, we're going to set that prize number position equal to zero so that so that it no longer prints that card. So let's test this. So if I set Squirtle down, let's see if we can destroy that card, which we have done. Now, the next thing I want to do is evolve Squirtle here because that should allow, because that should create another card here. And if it does, we know that the opponent object is able to create a new card in that position. If it could not, that means we did not clear all of the information in this spot properly. So if I set War Turtle down, we can see that War Turtle is set, which is great. But I should now be able to select one of these prize cards. Now, one thing that should happen is whenever we need to select a prize card, we should not be able to do anything, just so the game flows like it should. So I want to make sure that the player can't draw cards, use trainer cards, or set any more cards on the field. So let's see if I can select one of these cards. And I'm going to select in the middle so that my mouse will actually be over two cards at one time. And with the code we added in the prize card left released event, only one should be drawn. So I did draw one. It was Gyarados. Immediately the sprite changed to the appropriate card and I only selected one 
and it moved from this position to my hand and it is in my hand. So I should be able to use it. So let's set Magikarp on the field and see if I can set this Gyarados on top of it, which I can. Now, another thing we want to do is be able to destroy our own card. But since we don't have an opponent to play against our card, we need to create an instance in our game that will allow me to add damage to this card so that it can then be destroyed. So now let's force the player to pause. Oh, and as you can see, I can no longer select another prize card. If I destroy the opponent, I can select another one. And you can see at the other end that the prize cards are being removed. So now let's force the player to pause whenever they need to select a prize card. So all we have to do is go to our pause script and add this condition. If the prize select variable is true, return one. So now let's do it one more time. So if I destroy the opponent card, let's see if I can use any of these trainer cards. Nope. Nope. I can't draw a card either. And I can't even select the field card. So now let's select one of these cards and see if now I can use these card objects, which I can, I can draw again, and I can use these trainer cards. So now let's create code to destroy our own card. And that's going to be in our object field card. In our step event, at the very top, we're going to create this condition. If we release the enter button on our keyboard, we want to increment the damage counters of this field card. So that will allow us to add damage counters to our Pokemon. And now within this condition here, if health points is equal to damage counters, we can then destroy our card and allow the opponent to take a prize card. So the code in order to do that is we are going to send a message to the opponent saying that at this position we're going to set the value equal to zero we're going to set our field position equal to zero we're going to set the field card position equal to no one so that we can set another card in this position and then we're going to destroy the card the next thing we're going to need to do is allow the opponent to take a prize card but since we don't have an opponent yet and we won't be able to test it we're going to leave this comment here so let's do our final test but before we do that i want to start with a certain hand and that hand is going to be scoop up squirtle i want to have potion and super potion and then I also want to start with plus power and defender. But since we're changing these cards, we want to remove these comments since they will no longer match. So I added potion and super potion so we can test these cards now that our cards have damage counters on them. So if I set Squirtle down, if I press the enter button, we can see that a damage counter is on our Squirtle and not the opponent's. I'm going to add two more damage counters on there so that we can test Potion. Potion should just remove two damage counters from Squirtle. So if I drop this on top of Squirtle, we can see he now only has one. The next thing I want to do is evolve him into War Turtle. We can see he still has the same amount of damage counters. I want to add more than four and then try to use Super Potion. Now, Super Potion allows me to remove four damage counters from a Pokemon, but only if he has an energy card on top of him 
to remove it. So since he doesn't have any energy on him, I should not be able to use this card, which I cannot. Now what if I add a non-energy card to his pile? Let's see if it allows me to use it. And it does not. So if I take an energy card and add it to War Turtle, if I use Super Potion, it now forces me to select a, an energy card. So if I try to select War Turtle, it doesn't allow me. Squirtle plus Power or Defender. If I select Bite or Withdraw, nothing happens. But if I select the energy card, he's back to only having one damage counter and he no longer has that energy on him. Now one thing we're going to need to do later on is update the opponent that we no longer have that energy card on our Pokemon. But again, since we don't have that opponent, we'll worry about that later. But now let's see if we can destroy this War Turtle. As you can see, it was destroyed. And since we sent the message to the opponent saying at this position is zero, it destroyed it over here too. This is something we want to test to ensure that the opponent is being updated properly. Now, we want to see if we can set a card at this position to make sure that we cleared all of the information for this position properly. Because if we did not, we would not be allowed to set a Pokemon here. And we can. So that's fantastic. What we'll still need to do is create conditions to so that these moves won't be able to be used unless we have the appropriate energy on them. But we'll cover that in a later video. In the next video, we're going to create summon animations and defeat animations to make our game look a little more professional. So if you're interested in that and enjoy this series, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to support this series and download these program files, be sure to check out my Patreon linked in the description below. Until next time.